What's going on? Thank you for joining another session of Quarantine Conversations. I have a special guest here today. Uh, many of you might not know him. Uh, well known in the entertainment and athletic circles. He's played professionally overseas, had a successful career. He's a graduate of University of Penn. He also has a master's from the University of Liverpool. A uh, very sharp guy, a uh, good friend of mine, the homie, West Coast, Coco, Archer Bong. What it is, Coke? Man, you know, we're blessed, bro. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. No, nah, man, I appreciate you taking time out, man, and, and chopping it up with me for, for, for however long we're going to be on here, man. I appreciate you taking the time out, though. Yep, yeah, it's my pleasure. So, man, let's, uh, for a lot of people who don't know who you are, let's just give them a brief, a brief, brief background of, you know, who you are and kind of, you know, where you come from. Just a little bit of that. Yeah, so let's take it back. My, both my parents are from Nigeria originally right. immigrated out here uh when they came here for school ended up staying having me i'm the oldest of two of i'm the oldest of three boys so i have two younger brothers underneath me um we grew up out here in, in pasadena california even though i was born in new york uh, we were raised out here so like you said west coast in it all day this is home i'm back home We lost you for a seat. There you go. I don't know if I can block my calls while I'm on here. I cut out for a second, right? Yeah, yeah. It was just, yeah. Sorry about that. I just got a call on my phone. Let me see if I can block. Hit that do not disturb. Uh, there you are. All right. Yeah, so. Grew up out here in Pasadena, uh, went to a small school, ended up growing a lot <laughs> in high school. Started out as a soccer player because that was my first sport. That's our, my first love, and my, that's what my dad knew. Uh, so that's what he taught me. Uh, but as fate would have it, I just kept working at it. And when I started really playing seriously in ninth grade, I was probably 5'10", 5'11", so I was working on guard skills and things like that. But by the time I finished high school, I was 6'7". And so I grew a ton in that time and then ended up being a kind of a sleeper recruit. And, um, you know, in that time, Penn was one of the first schools that recruited me. So, you know, it was kind of a match made in heaven. I did my research on them as a school, saw that, like, what a great education I could get there and play top-notch basketball. So... It was a no-brainer for me. I wanted the best of both worlds, and I got it. Uh, played four years out there, had a great career, enjoyed myself tremendously, made friendships and brotherhoods that you know are going to last me for a lifetime. Which I, you know, you know, nothing can uh, you know top that. It was really the I, I would say college is definitely the most fun I've had in my life. I don't know if you agree. That was that. that was it. it was it. And so, you know, I had a great time. And then following that, I, I, you know, I was there to become a doctor. That was my goal. I've always focused on becoming a doctor. I was pre-med. Okay. So before you go into that, that's all right. Before you go into that, yeah. I want to ask you how, because you, you got, you, you got your, you got your degree from Penn in what? Medical anthropology. So it's basically how do other, how do other cultures study medicine? How do they implement medicine? So I was already pre-med. I was learning Western medicine. I was like, I want to learn about how other societies and cultures are doing medicine too. So then I could be a different kind of doctor, right? I could talk to people about all the options that they might have, not just here, take these pills. And then they, they don't really get better. They just keep coming back to me, right? So, so maybe I didn't do you any justice with my introduction no, let no, people didn't. know how bright and intelligent of a man you are. Uh, uh, like you said, man, you went to school to be a doctor, but you ended up pursuing a basketball career. Like, how was like, how was that? Uh, God moments, man. They're all God moments. That's how I see it. I mean, I really, I really, I didn't bank on basketball. I didn't know 
I didn't know where it was going to take me. I was grateful for every opportunity that I got to play and to continue to play because I saw a lot of my friends who were way better than me growing up, um, their careers end a lot earlier, right? Whether I was in high school or even before that sometimes. So for me, I was just always continuing to push and get better over time. And I would say it didn't really dawn on me that I could potentially play professionally till my junior year in college. And that's where me and a couple of my teammates had the opportunity to go down to Sarasota, the IMG camp. And that was, you know, that was the first taste that I got of like the next level of basketball. It was, you know, as you can imagine, it was a whole bunch of NBA guys there working out uh, in the summertime. But then it was also all the college players that were getting ready for the draft at that time. They are working out and everything like that. And there were some scouts and some agents and people that were around the whole situation. And I was right there in the mix. And not only was I in the mix, I was, I was thriving. And so that was what I needed as a player and as a person to be like, oh, this, this, is, this could be a real thing for me. And it just, you know, I had a great junior year. Started getting, you know, started getting some NBA looks and that, that the rest is kind of history. I finished, I still made sure I finished all my requirements to go to medical school, but, you know, I got to that, that last year and the Lakers were, you know, wanted, I didn't get drafted, but the Lakers wanted me to come to camp and they were, they had been telling my agent, you know, since in the year. And so I was like, I got to shoot this shot. You know, how do I not? And then me thinking it would be a short, you know, couple years that I might try this thing and then go back to medical school turn into 10 years of playing professional ball so it, like I said God God moments man God moments he took took me on a path that I you know I didn't know was set for me but ended up being exactly where I was supposed to be so basically I mean for a guy like yourself who was a real well-rounded individual man uh like I said very very intelligent guy who, who knows a little bit about a lot of things. Basketball basically was just a hobby for you. Bas kind, of, kind of basically, like, you know what I'm saying? Like you said, like it was, this was, this, this not, being a professional basketball player isn't what you necessarily planned. It kind of just happened, you went with the flow. And like you just said, like you was basically like, all right, man, I, you know, this might last for two, three, four years maybe. And, you know, I, I'll go back to, you know, for someone being a, being a doctor, getting in the, you know, in the doctor field. Yeah, yeah, I think, and we talked about it briefly, we touched on it a little bit in our earlier conversation, but honestly, basketball, I've always seen basketball as a vehicle. I've always seen sports as a vehicle for a bigger purpose, right, you know, right. whether that was, you know, getting a great education, getting the opportunity to get a great education, or getting the opportunity to see the world, uh, getting the opportunity to represent my, you know, my family's home country in the Olympics, which I got to do, right? So all these things were made possible through this game. And I, you know, as I look back on that time that we had playing, I see now that basketball, not only has it always been a vehicle, it's also been the greatest teacher about life that we can ever have. Because really it just, it mirrors life in so many ways. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, like you, am extremely blessed to have had the opportunity to really ride all the waves that it has for us. Cause like, I think there's just so many lessons that I learned playing basketball that I apply every single day to what everything that I do, that it's, it's pretty, it's just a special thing. So, you know, it, it became much more for me, but going into it, I actually feel really, you know, I feel lucky that I grew up in the family that I did because my parents knew nothing. They didn't know anything about trying to play basketball at a higher level. It's like, what is that? So they never, they never pushed me to do more than I wanted to do. I just love playing. And I, uh, yeah, to be very honest, I hated, I hated, I sucked, right? So like, I hated not being good at something. So that's what, that's what drove me at first. I was like, I just need to get better at this. So I was working my tail off, like, you know, come in early, stay late, right? All the, the, the you know, and just I started from the bottom, learn all the fundamentals. And then I had a coach that took, you know, took me under his wing and really gave me that extra practice and extra work that you need to get better at anything and show me how to master the craft. And it just so happened that, you know, in a family where my parents, you know, my mom is five, five, five on a good day. My, my dad is five, nine. I end up being six, nine at the end of the whole thing. Right. So, yeah. you know, you can't tell me God's not involved in that process. Right. right? Yeah. So, but like all that to say, I got lucky because growing up basketball and sports were just gravy on top. It was always about education. Right. That was always the focus in our house. 
It's like, that. you know, my parents, are, it always just rings in my ears. Like, they can take everything away from you, but they can't take what's in your mind. They can't take what you know. And so that's, that was always the thing that always, like, drove me, drove my brothers. And so, you know, it, it just, it's, it's something that I try to, you know, impress on the, on the younger players that I get a chance to talk to is, you know, this idea of being more than an athlete, it's a real thing. And we all are. It's just we don't, we don't recognize thing. it. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. I mean, and it's built. It's been a real thing. I think now the guy, the athletes now, are all in, in many different sports, they understand it better, and they're they're taking advantage of the platforms to make sure that people know that you know I'm more than an athlete. You know, it's you know it's more than it's, I'm more than just you know just just player. Or I'm more than just, just about the sport I play. Uh, but to go back briefly man like i really did butcher your introduction really i no. did no no why? no bro do you olympian what you mean why i didn't you know what i'm saying like like we can't gaze over that man like we can't get like also uh, olympian representing like you said his parents home country nigeria in the 2012 was it olympics or the world or the world it was olympics yeah 12 olympics man uh i would we would get into that but this this is not even a basketball yeah. between you know this is not in a basketball conversation but yeah Oak Archibald, also man the olympian uh let, just to put that out there because we kind of he kind of just threw that out there subtly and just kept going but uh, Sometimes uh like i, I said a man who's who's accomplished and, and has done some amazing things on many different platforms so all right coco so you have this you have a successful european overseas career uh yeah 10 years, a decade, man, which is, I mean, for a lot of guys, they don't get to see four or five years, you know what I'm saying? So salute to you on that, man, because I, I mean, like I said, I know how hard it is. We played together, which a lot of people don't know. Me and Coach, me and Coco was teammates uh, in a very special but crazy situation. <laughs> uh, yeah. One of the coolest guys, not just teammates, but just one of the coolest guys I've known. I'm gonna tell you, I don't know if you remember this, Coco, so I'm already not a talkative guy. Yeah. You're not that talkative either. So we end up on the same team. And uh, you was already there. You, yeah. Ronnie, you, you know, you was already there. So y'all kind of already, you and D-Lo had kind of mm -hmm. already had, you know, the vibes of what was going on. I came to training camp kind of late. And yeah. I don't know if you remember, bro. I just remember you. Uh, you wouldn't say too much, but you would be listening to, like, the conversations going on around us. And I knew, I knew, you was fed up when you finally said something. I was like, oh, he, he fed up with the <laughs> He fed up with the nine. Because you would let a lot of stuff go. But when you said something, I mean, I was like, yeah, Coco, he fed up with the BS, bro. He like, he, he, about, to, he, about, to, he about to put his foot down. Because you don't know, you normally used to be like, all right, man, whatever. Man, Y'all ain't talking about nothing. You know what I'm saying? Because I didn't really realize it either. Like, you told me, I don't know if you remember this. You told me, he was like, yeah, what's up, man? Whatever, whatever. We introduced and we get to know each other. And I was like, yeah, what school you went to? He was like, I went to Penn, right? <laughs> So I was like, oh, okay, that's what's up, Penn State. <laughs> he was like, no. <"Nah." laughs> it happens. Everybody thinks Penn State. It's the first thing they think. It's yeah, normal, like, man. I was like, what you mean? He was like, no, nah, I went to University of Penn. And I didn't realize at the time that that was a Ivy League school, right? Like, to backtrack on what I just said, when, when I got to know you more and when you would chime in, I was like, okay, yeah, that's why he went to Ivy League school. Like, dude, sharp. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because you wouldn't really waste your time talking about nonsense. But when you spoke, like you was, you was knowledge. You know what I'm saying? You was, you was speaking with a lot of, a lot of knowledge, and you know what I'm saying? Just real. Like it was real. I don't even know the word, man. But I was like, okay, I see why this dude went to went to, he was the Ivy League and went to an Ivy League school. I appreciate it, man. Uh, I love, I love that locker room, man. I loved it. We had a great team. We had a mob, and you know, we had a lot of fun times. And you know, I always. I would pride myself on trying to be a, uh, you know, great teammate. That's, you know, at the end of the day, when I, I, when people ask me, I always tell them like, I don't think I was a great basketball player. I was a really good, I was a really great athlete. Um, I got better at basketball over time for sure. But my real, the thing that I feel like I was best at is being a teammate. And so I love being a teammate. I miss that the most of not getting to play. Um, but I found that in what I'm doing now in wealth management, right. Partnering with and teaming up with, families to help them for the long term but that locker room that was that was a special place man because it's like 
I, and I think a very underutilized place. So that's, you know, to your point, like I always think back on the times we had all together, like in those, in all the experiences we had. And I'm like, man, did I, I was, I'm, I'm glad to hear I was speaking a little bit of truth to power in those days. I wish I would have understood more about this life game. So I could have been, you know, even more of a resource to people while I was, you know, while we're shoulder to shoulder in those locker rooms. But I know there's people now in the game that should be helping their teammates more. And there's teammates that need to be listening to their, you know, to their vets and people that have gone through stuff. But we, you know, we just need to open these conversations up more. So I'm very, I'm glad that you, you are, you know, coming out of your shell. You know, I see you, you're out there, you're talking to the youth. You're, you're, you know, you're giving them, you know, giving them your wisdom and guidance, you're planting seeds, it's powerful. And you're doing these conversations. And hopefully, you know, it resonates with the other athletes and um, that are out there that are younger, that are still doing it. Um, but also, you know, other people in our community that, you know, we should be having more open dialogue about things that affect us all. And that aren't necessarily, it's good to have the, you know, the cars, cars, girls, jewelry conversation too. But like, let's, let's move past that too. Like, let's. Well, like you said, like you said, man, uh, at the time, I mean, we could all look back on different situations in life and, you know, 2020 is hindsight and we were all were young. You know, I, I, my second year in Europe, you know, it was my fourth year as a pro, but my second year in Europe, like we still very young. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? You only like five or six, you know, maybe five or six years in yourself. And it's yeah. not that, it's not that you didn't do a good job. Like I said, when you're young and you don't know how, I think most, I think at times when we don't, Take advantage of those opportunities. It's like, man, I don't know how these guys are going. Am I gonna waste my time? You know what I'm saying? Right. Because like you right. said, like we in a, we and we talking a lot. We having conversations. It's not like we wasn't inter in, in, interacting with each other. We interacting with each other a lot. Like everybody was cool, and we would talk about, like you said, the nonsense, cars, clothes, you know, music. You know what I'm saying? We'd talk about the nonsense, uh, but we wouldn't really be talking about, like you said, like life situations. You know kind of like life plans, what we really want to do you know, mm -hmm. after fall, you know what I'm saying? Or just, just marry. Like we wasn't talking about that type of stuff. Like we were young, uh, but like you said, basketball has been a vehicle for us to grow and mature. And now we're in these positions like yourself uh, to give back, to help, uh, you know, to, to, to mentor, uh, yeah. to, you know, to, to, to provide advice and, now is the time where we have to take complete, complete advantage of that for the benefit of those, those around us and those coming up under us, you know? Yeah, yeah, yep, wholeheartedly. That's the so, mission, man. Yeah, so man, so the fact that you said like, we need to uh, talk, have more conversations like this, you know, in our communities and, and amongst family, friends, or whatever the case may be, associates and peers, so now you you retired. It's been a few years now, but you retired from basketball. Like I said, you had a successful career, and you yeah. went on to get into uh, like the wealth management, private capital industry, right? So yes, Coco now is the vice president. You're the vice president. Yeah, one of. So in my position, there are in my company. There's about forty of us, I'd say across mm -hmm. the country we have offices in la that's the headquarters san francisco um, new york chicago atlanta and that's it i believe but uh, and we have a palm beach office as well but yeah, i think it's like some tiny but like yeah there's so at Ca the company i work for is capital group is called capital group and it's been around for nine decades since since the Great Depression, so 1931. Privately privately held group that does only investments for the long term, stocks and bonds, and that's all we've done for all those 90 years. And they're they're one of the best best at the best at it. So that's why I chose I chose to work there because there's a bunch of different firms where you can be a financial advisor or a private wealth advisor, but I chose to work there because one, they've been highly successful for their whole history, but two, because it's a firm that you can trust, right? Like I needed, because I was new to the industry and I'm already was skeptical. Like I think most people, when you hear, oh, financial advisor, you're like, 
what is this person trying to sell me, right? But like, and so that was, I'm no different. When my mentor, mentor of mine, like suggested that I even look into it, I was like, it doesn't seem like it would be a fit for me. That's not my thing. I'm not trying to sell anybody on anything. Like, why would I do this? But what really prompted me to make this move was one, you know, I was, I was going to be able to help people and their families directly in an area that I know we all need a ton of help um, in, in the finances, but also I needed a place that I could trust implicitly, right? If people entrusted me with their money, I needed them to also trust the firm behind me. And that's what Capital Group provides because if you look at the track record, like no black marks on their name, like pretty much, I think I can safely say every single bank, every single major bank out there has all kinds of infractions and violations and, and you know, things that they've had to pay for, like billions of dollars, not millions, billions of dollars that they've paid in fines over the years for just doing wild stuff, right? Wells Fargo is opening fake accounts in people's names. Like what? Who does that? Right. So then, so if you're doing, if you're doing a business like this where it's all about trust, and the firm behind you is not something you could trust, it's like it's not going to work. And so I wanted, knowing what my mission was, which was to try to help, especially in the African American and the minority communities as much as I could, but in this area anyway, that's really sensitive. I knew I needed a place that people could trust with no questions, and that's what Capital Group is. So how long have you been with how long have you been with a uh, capital group? Five years now, which is it's crazy to, to think how fast time is going, but it really it tracks my it tracks my son's life, Asaya. And you know, he's a big catalyst for me making this move. Like there's a step in between there that I don't know, it always it kind of gets missed in my resume, but I worked at my old high school. So I was the assistant athletic director and I was, you know, doing everything you would think. I was coaching, teaching, and I was doing community outreach. And I loved it. It was great. I mean, I was there for about two years, one and a half, two years. And, but it was like, when we found out we were pregnant with, with, uh, with Asaya, it was like the world changed, man. Like everything turned on his head. I was like, oh man, nah, we got to go. It's time. It's time to, it's time to kick it into high gear, coach. Cause it was like, you know, I was chilling. I was able to kind of network and, and talk, reach out to old friends and, you know, cause I was still figuring myself out that transition out of the game, I don't have to tell you, it's, it's hard, man. It is, it's one of the hardest things I think anybody can have to go through. So, just okay, I'm glad crazy. you said that. So how prepared were you? And you, in, in my opinion, you've been a guy who's been pretty prepared about your life, you know, and kind of exactly more kind of what you wanted to do, even with basketball. I mean, you kind of think you kind of knew, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think you kind of knew like, okay, I only want to play this game for a certain amount of time, but then I want to, you know, I want to, I want to get into something else. And I, you, you might have knew what that something else was, or kind of knew, had had an idea, but like you just said, like retirement is tough, and uh, until you go through it, you really don't understand how tough it is. For one, especially being a former professional athlete, you've been doing something for for so long, right? Your routines has been has been basically already scripted for you, you know. Uh, and then you come back to, it's basically, especially a guy being overseas, you come back to like real life, you know, as far as being home yeah. with your family, getting incorporated with that, like, you know, getting on the schedule with your kids. If you have kids, you know, when you retire, getting on schedule with your kids, like school and all that, you know, just that stuff, it, it's, it, it took me like a year to really get adjusted. Like, man, okay, I'm home now. I'm, I got to get up. You know, I got to. I got to figure out, you know, how to help my wife with either taking the kids to school or picking the kids to school up. You know what I'm saying? Have a day, a day or two where I, I try to cook or whatever the case may be. Uh, Couple with anything. Yeah, like it's it's, an, it's a real adjustment, man. On top of on top yeah. of that, though, but on top of that, you're trying to figure out, all right, what am I gonna do next? Who am I? Yeah, like Who what am I? I gonna do? And not it wasn't necessarily that for me. It was just like, okay, what what really what did I really want to try to put my time into now? Now mm. that I'm done playing, right? Mm. And, yeah. for, and and that doesn't necessarily come to everybody right away. For some guys, it do. Some guys, it click. Like I said, some guys know right off the bat. All right, when I'm done, I want to get coaching or X, Y, and Z. For me, I was like, man, I don't know. I didn't know. I'm like, what is it? Like, cause I knew, like, you know, it wasn't a couple of things. So I was like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe yeah, I get. But so, man, uh, just speak on that for the, like that your transition. Like, how hard of how hard was that for you? Uh, it was tremendously hard. And to your point, like I 
I thought of myself as a person that's usually well prepared for things too. But no, I was completely wrong. Like I had no idea. And you, and you know, I think you hit it on the head. I don't think you ever really know what retirement is going to be like till you retire. And then you're faced with the reality of the fact that like you are in this next phase of your life officially, like legitimately, and you got to figure it out. And yeah, like, I don't know. It was crazy. Like I thinking back, I don't even like thinking back on that time. Cause it was, it was a pretty dark place for me. I would say just cause like I was, I was depressed, bro. I think that's really like not having the words for it. I think now there's more, understanding around mental health issues and things of that nature but i was i think that i was depressed you know because I, I i'm with you i had a moment i had a moment right and i'm still transitioning i don't really but i kind of know where i want to go now right but i'm you know so but i had a moment right a few months where i was like same thing you just said like i think i'm depressed because i've never i've never i've never been depressed in my life. I never felt like I was depressed. But at this moment, I, you know, I'm done playing. I'm at home trying to figure out what I'm going to do. You know, and I'm just like, bro, like, why do I feel like this? And I was like, I think, I told my wife, I, like, I think I think I'm depressed. And she was like, about time you realized it. And I was like, man, like, but that's yeah. just something like I've never felt this way. So that was the only way I could try to explain it. Yeah. And we're so used to you know, doing what we do or what we did anyway in that, in that arena, you don't have time to, you can't play yourself small. You're always building yourself up to do great things every time you get on the stage. Right. And so when you're left with none of that juice and adrenaline and you're just faced with yourself and you didn't, you know, whatever plan, you know, goes out the window and you're just like, I don't know what I'm going to do. It was hard, man. I didn't really, it just works on you. 10 years of doing the same thing, being defined in a way, it works on you. And I didn't really realize how much I was wrapped up in that identity. You know, I was, yeah, I just, I, I didn't realize how much I loved being able to say, yeah, I hope when every, when everybody, literally everybody asked me, right? If you're six nine, everybody sees you. They're like, "Please tell me you play basketball." Yeah. And to be able to, to be able to say, "Yeah," you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, it's not only a relief, but it was like there's a pride. There's a pride that's underneath it that I didn't really pay attention to until yeah. it was gone. And then I dreaded that question. And then I had to figure out what my answer was going to be. At, right. So there's all these little things that people that you don't pay attention to that are going on. That I needed to, you know, I needed to change the page. I need to turn the page and change the narrative. And I couldn't do it. You can't do it quickly, man. It just, it takes the time that it takes. So I went into kind of hibernation mode. I'm so blessed to have my younger brothers who, you know, they've always been my biggest fans, but also my, my best friends. So, you know, I got to just lean on them. I went and stayed for like a month with my younger, my middle brother. He's like, just come out. And like for the first time, I was the little brother. I was just sleeping on his couch, doing, you know, just doing nothing, Try, reading writing you know writing myself notes about like just the thoughts just get them out like what what could i what could i think about doing that i feel like could be anything like playing that i feel like would be fulfilling that i feel like would you know make me feel like i have a purpose again that that's worth and a, and a goal that's worth striving for and i just put all i shot all the shots out there and then i started to you know hone it down like okay what are a couple things that i feel like make sense and who do I know? And then I just started making calls. And that's how, that's, that's really how the process started. But it, it took, yeah, man, it took two, I would say two good years for me to get reacclimated and settle and feel okay with where my story was at that time. And then, the, and that I, I see a way forward to, you know, to greater things. Cause like the question that keep, kept bugging me out was like, did I just live the best time of my life? And I'm 32, right? And I did it for longer than most people. So it's like, but it's like, you have so much more life to live. So you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> like, what else? Yeah. Uh, but, but that's why I'm also so grateful to have found what I'm doing now. Cause it's like, it's, it's, it gives me the energy. I have that same energy to get, I get up in the morning. I'm like, yep, got a win today. And there's something to drive towards, you know, and there's something 
uh, it's a bigger, higher purpose. It's bigger than me. And I actually love it. And I don't want to say, I don't want to go overboard and say I love it more than hoop, but it's like, it's a lifetime game, right? So where I knew, whereas you know, hoops is always going to end. Like even now, like a little bit that I get out there and try to play, it's like, it's nothing like right in my mind. I'm still back. I'm still back with us, you know, in, in 07. My body though, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like, that, yeah. that gets frustrating. Even my, even the game I love gets frustrating where I'm like, I just, I'd rather just go shoot form shots outside by myself than even like get out there and not play like I want to play. Uh, but this, what I'm doing with the investing and like helping families and it's a lifelong, it's lifelong learning. And it's like, uh, it's always changing. Right. So I'm like, that's exciting for me. Cause it's like, Oh, okay. It's something big to, you know, to keep striving for and keep growing in. And it's, and it's important, right. It's important work. But yeah, man, I, I don't know, like, yeah, a big part of what I feel like I feel called to do, like I think similar to you, is is reach back and try to open up these topics with younger players or players that are going through so that they can, because I don't think that we all need to stumble in the same way. I think everybody's going to have to deal with it on their own, but like, at least if you hear, if you hear it from some, from enough people, you can hopefully catch catch wind of it and start to try to say, okay, maybe I can start reaching out to people a little bit earlier. Maybe I can, um, or at least you just have it in your mind, like, okay, this is going to be a difficult time. I need to be careful and not let myself fall too deeply into this hole so I can't get back out. But it's okay to feel like this. It's just going to be for a little bit, for some time. You know what I mean? Like, just little well, stuff I like mean, that. I think, I think a lot of it is – as far as you saying, like reaching back and helping the, the younger generation, the younger guys and people around you. I think for us, right, we coming from our families where we the first in our families to to have money, right? Yep. So our parents didn't necessarily, or not didn't, but couldn't necessarily teach us, you know, financial literacy like we, like we needed to know it, becoming professional athletes. You know what I'm saying? It's yep. like, all right, it, I, if you knew better, you do better. And I, you know, that's, I mean, that's a real, like, if you know better, a lot of the choices, a lot of mistakes I probably made as a, as coming up when I was younger is because, all right, I had good intentions, but I didn't necessarily know better. I didn't have all the information or the right accurate information to, you know what I'm saying, to make some of the, and I'm talking about financial, to make some of the decisions I, I made. Yeah. So that's a big part of like, just now, like, man, I'm trying to just help kids and, and younger guys, just man, look, bro, like just, just shed little nuggets here and there. Like, look, I, I've, I've made these mistakes. I made that mistake. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it can be avoided, but you have to, you have to speak out to your people. We don't like asking. Like, money is a sensitive. It's a very, it's, it's sensitive topic, but it's a very sensitive topic within like the black community. Like, people. Yeah. Don't have, Definitely not talking about their own money. It's hard for people to talk about their own, their own financial uh, situation. situation. That's a big yeah. thing in itself. Yep. Yeah. I, I think it's one of the biggest things. I think it's one of the biggest reasons that we as a culture, yeah, man, for lack of a better term, are getting left behind when it comes to this whole wealth building thing. I think by and large, pretty much every culture out there uh, outside of us is talking about it at least more than we are and they're and they are using group economics to further themselves and they're keeping the dollars within their community much better than I feel like we do right so there's like so many but it comes from it it comes from an underlying understanding of how this game is working right and and part and you know to this isn't to denigrate black folks because there has to be an acknowledgement of the systemic issues that are in place as well, right? So like, you've got 400 years of slavery in this country. You, you had a situation where you're pitting us all against each other. Of course, that's gonna breed a dynamic where people are skeptical of their own people. Whereas if in every, in, shoot, I was gonna say in every major city in America, but like all over the world, you can find a Chinatown. Right. And it's, and it's not just their businesses. They have taken over the whole thing. All the signs, you can't even read anything if you don't know Chinese, right? 
like how do you do, right and like everybody has their communities but like we're so fragmented and not collect not working collectively as it pertains to this area that it becomes hard to mobilize you know it becomes really hard to mobilize but i you know to your point it starts in the home i like you exactly we're the first to really come through you know you deal with that dynamic of being in your 20s and being the most paid person in your family like what do you do with that and everybody sacrificed for you to get where you're supposed to be you're like oh of course i'm about to give everything back like take it i, put, I think i'm i put my stuff on black but i'm pretty i put gave my whole first check to my family i came home from the summer after a year and uh, like a six months stint in, in france where i was pretty pretty miserable actually like we talked about a little earlier and didn't know if i was going to make it or if i was going to even have a career in basketball i gave that i turned that whole check over to my mom and dad just on them needing something and like they don't don't ask me twice you don't have to ask me twice didn't think didn't think anything of it right you know and not i'm not saying that to say that i would change that decision today but it's okay. my yeah my goal my goal and my hope exactly just have a plan yeah. if i my my mission is about control is helping folks get gain control over their finances it's being conscious about how you're spending your money and why where your dollars are going now if you choose to use it for things that you have great intentions on and you feel like that's the right decision you should do it and to help i feel like you should always help right i think they're now understanding what i understand i think there are ways to help and and ways that can be actually detrimental to the people you're right. trying to help right right so that's a bigger discussion right like you just throwing money at stuff that's not helping people you could you know if you teaching people how to fish you're actually helping them really more right but like helping them work through some of the issues that they're facing as opposed to just like, okay, man, no problem. You know, I got it. So I'm going to just pay for it. Um, but to that's, me, the, that's the thing though, Coco, uh, that right there, this, we just talking about, you know, our culture, of, our culture of people. Like we don't necessarily teach those around us how to fish. Like the big dog, whoever, you know, whoever become the big dog, in, you know, in, in your community or in your family, not necessarily, like you said, they have great intentions on to help everyone. But like you said, sometimes that help is detrimental because we're just giving. All right, you need this here. You need, you know what I'm saying? Man, look, I know you got this need. All right, this is for that need. I need you to, the best thing you can do with the rest of this money is put it here. Or, or use it for the, you know what I'm saying? Like we just turn over the money and then two weeks later, that individual is like, yo, blase, blase, blase. You know what I'm saying? They like did like, I don't know what happened. You know what I'm saying? And then it's just a, it's just a revolving door of until that individual gets to the point where he's more, or she, he or she is more knowledgeable about like, God dog, like I can't keep doing this. Like it's, it's draining me, I want to help. But it's also you you haven't gotten better with you know with the with the stuff I've given you. I can't keep giving you this, but when you don't teach or when you don't know, sometimes we sometimes the the, the person who has the means to teach doesn't know themselves, so they can't teach. Precisely. Precisely. You've got to have a plan. And I feel like that's that's the missing ingredient. And if you haven't been hearing about it, you know. Yeah, exactly. What yeah. you think is gonna happen? It's ridiculous. It's like when I like, I don't really, I I can't fade the media when when it comes to this topic because I feel like they always want to portray us as like the villain. Like, look at these kids. Like, they're just out here spending all this money. Like, how can you blow through that much money? I'm like, easy. You giving it? There's nothing but opportunities out here to spend money, man. And they give you even more when when you start making that much money. I right. saw even you know even when you're in college. It's like they you see, there's a level of celebrity. People just start giving you stuff. People just start bringing stuff to your attention that like you don't know anything any better about. But now all of a sudden you have a bank account that supports it. So you're like, well, yeah, looks fun, looks interesting. Why not? I Can't got hurt, it. right? I, I, got I got it. it. I, got I got it. it. I got it. I got it. Mentality, right? But it's like I'm just I'm I'm excited. What gets me hype is 
seeing the younger generation and feeling like we're in a wave where they are thinking about this stuff and they are trying to be intentional about what they do. And they are, they are valuing things that I think are, that have longevity, like investing, like being entrepreneurs, like being business owners. And I'm just like thinking, you know, I know you have young kids. I have a young son who's five and usually, and the, one of the silver linings about this whole quarantine thing is he's around me 24 seven. We've been together the whole time. So like I'm taking calls, he's catching the seeds that I'm planting with others just by nature. So he's not with me right now because he's probably on the iPad doing something. He's being too quiet back there. I need to go check what he's doing. But by default, right, he's on a call with me right. and hearing, hearing this. So my hope is like he's going to be asking questions. But even if he's not, I'm planting, I'm planting these right. seeds with him already. Work. Yeah, you have to plant. You have to teach him. That. Yeah, right. No, that's, I mean, that's good, man. I saw one of my, one of my good friends sent a sent a, a IG IG video to me about this 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 man teaching his son about assets and liabilities. Mind you, I saw that. You saw that? I loved it. Yeah, yeah. It was everything. That thing was everything. His son was that's, on it. That's really like we got to start early teaching our kids about money, wealth. You know what I'm saying? And we got to start early, man. Especially just even if you don't necessarily have it, like you, your kids need to know about about this because they're not going to learn it in school. You know, we're not learning that in college. You know, you're not taught these things unless somebody, like you said, unless somebody's planting these seeds in, in you and taking time to invest this stuff into you. are not going to learn this stuff uh, on your own for the most part. Like somebody has to pass it down. It has to be yeah. passed down. And then what you do with it is, is up to you. But like for us, before we, it wasn't passed down to us. So when we got in our situations of making money, However much that was, it was way more than our parents had ever seen, right? So, I mean, of course, we were going to make mistakes, you know. Uh, but, but man, this last these last couple of minutes we have, man, I want you, I want to get your opinion and your thoughts and your advice just on the climate of what's going on with the economy, yeah. How people can make good decisions or you know better prepare themselves for to be in this thing for however long we're going to be in this thing, you know, as it relates to uh, the coronavirus and how it's impacting it's impacting everybody uh you know whether you got a little bit of money a lot of money it's, it's, it's hitting everybody yeah yes it is yes it is and I think in more ways than than normal right because there's one thing it's one thing for the market to go down you know you lose money that's terrible people don't like you know it messes up people's retirement their nest eggs puts people's security in, at risk in a certain way right but like you can manage that. This is mortal risk. This is people losing their lives. So this affects, like you said, rich people and poor people because rich people by and large sometimes tend to be a lot older. So they were, they're they like the group that's actually at the most risk in terms of the health stuff and they're seeing their money go down. So, you know, I would say, you know, it's, it's an unprecedented time, no question. But in that, I was thinking about like what I feel like the most important lessons that I've been kind of taking away from this right now are. And it really keeps coming back to the fact that this is a huge reset button. And I think people need to understand what this reset button means for them on all levels, right? right. So I have tons of conversations. I just got off of one before we got on a conversation where we were talking about this is a reset in terms of life priorities, right? What's really, what, what really do I need to be giving my time, attention, and energy to? You know, what matters most out here? Who do I want to, who do I need to make sure knows that I love them the most, right? In terms of family and friends and the people that, you know, matter. And that's, to me, that's been a lesson that 2020 has been giving me, you know what I'm saying? And all of us, right from the gate, I'm like, Kobe, this now. I mean, and then you turn around, you got the Ahmad stuff, you know, down in Georgia and you're like, come on, man, like what's, what is it about? And it's like, hold the people you love, you know, closest to you, man. And, and, and make sure they know, cause you it's never, no day is a given. Right. So there's that, that piece of it on a person level. Right. But then you have, you have on the personal finance level and business finance for that matter, you have a situation where the whole economy shuts down, no movement. That's, it's never happened, yeah. except back in the Great Depression. 
that's in 1931. 1929, nobody, right? The crash. So it's nobody, like nobody living has went through the Great Depression. So yeah, it's thank never you. Happened, never happened in we our never, lifetime. We've never seen this. We've yeah. never seen this to where it's like. So the people that are the worst hit are the poorest people, because by and large, we're the ones. You're the ones, you know, in those service industries or in those manufacturing jobs where it's like everything's done. Or you're on the front lines because you know you have to go to work. And you have to be out there interacting with people that could be sick. But not only that, the poorest of our society, mostly minorities, mostly in our community, don't have enough savings to even withstand, you know, to, to withstand any kind of shock. So that's the, to me, that's the biggest reset is like, count your chickens, right? Like my guy said, count your chickens. But it's like, get, that, get your savings right. Get your, get your emergency fund where it needs to be. And if you didn't know that you need three months worth of money, six months worth of money, just sitting up somewhere, now you know. Because it's like, look what's happening. Right. And there's no telling. There really, we have experts on calls. Every Monday, we have an all hands on deck call with a different expert, White House advisor, top, top researcher at Harvard, you name it. You know, talking about what the virus is doing, how it could move, how we could flatten the curve, you know, responses the whole thing what they're telling the, the president to do and the whole thing that i'm hearing is one this is not over people acting like it's over they need to they need to relax two we 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 most likely are going to see a second wave of this and so how hard it hits us we don't know but this could this is most likely a part of the new normal so what does that mean that means you need to be ready to have to shelter in place again for the, for another for another month for two months. Are do you are you going to pay attention to that lesson and set up some money aside so that if you you and your family don't have any income, you can still survive? Are you going to or will that second wave come and hit and you're going to act surprised again? Like this time, like this time was a complete surprise. You couldn't like. I tell people all the time, like, people are like, yo, Coke, what should I be doing? How can I invest? I'm like, first of all, you needed to make the moves at the, at the end of last year. That's what we were doing for our clients. We already set money aside. We already had them. We already took them out of some of the sectors that got hit the worst because they looked a little shaky. Right. Right. So, like, you had to set up for it before. Now that we're in it, the best thing that you can do is prepare for the next time that it comes. Right. And that means starting from the bottom, making sure that you're putting money aside, have three months, six months worth of money set aside. Then from there, you can start to build up and start investing into this market because you're getting stuff actually at a lower price than it was back when things were at all time highs. Like if you look, if you look, bro, if you look at February for 11 years, the market went straight up and on February 19th or 20th, something like that, it was at an all time high. Like all time, people's accounts were booming. More 401k millionaires than we've ever had, right? And in 20 days, in 20 days, you saw basically a whole year's worth of gains wiped out. Wow. 20 days. It's the fastest drop on history, on record in history. So that's how fast things can change, right? But like the point isn't that like you can't ever, you can't, nobody could have predicted that. Nobody right. could have predicted how this thing played out. But what you can bank on is that there's going to be down times. You got to right. be prepared for ups and downs. So yeah, how will you be prepared for the next down time? Exactly, exactly. And that's what I'm. I'm, you know, I'm on my soapbox, bro, because it's like I, I feel like people need to recognize that this is where people are starting to separate themselves, right? The people that have, have the means, have advisors in place. They're making, we're making moves for them. We're making moves on their behalf because we already set up for these things. So I'm trying to get everybody to get to the starting line at least so we can start sprinting too with everybody else. Like, okay, let's just get, let's just get this in place, get some savings in place. So next time we see something, maybe the stock market dips down, I can push, I have enough savings to be good. And then I have some extra to put into these, the investments and into the market. Right. But like, you can't, it's not a, it's a time game. It's a time game. And that's where I feel like we get caught up because it's like, well, 
you know, you have that FOMO, people are like, well, I need to do something now. Like, this is the time. It's like, nah, there's going to come another time. It's just, are you ready for that time? It's the same thing. Whatever game you're in, it's like, what, it's funny, man. Like, I was thinking about this call, and I was thinking about one of the, the illest things that you ever told me when we were playing together that always sticks in my mind about how you look at offense. And I was like, man, do you, man. I love how smooth you play, bro. Like, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I was basically like, you know, and we were talking about speed. And you were like, yeah, the defense is trying to speed you up. That's exactly when you need to go slower to, keep, to be under control. Right. And it's the same thing with this investing thing. Like, I think about it all the time. Like, yeah, when you're on offense, you need to, you need to slow everything down to your pace. So you're watching, and then you can start to see the matrix for what it is, and you can see where the moves are for you. And just put your, put your money in those different baskets that are going to make you money over time, and then let them, let them grow. And so then, like, so I just try to help people take the pressure off of, like, they need to do something and, like, make these smart moves. It's like, nah, really, you just need to leverage time. If you can understand that you just, you're playing this long game, 20, 30 years, yeah. 40 years for some of these younger kids that are just starting their careers, it doesn't even matter what you invest in. It just matters that you're set up to start investing and you can do it consistently. Because the time, the time and compounding will take care of all the rest of it. And that's the magic of the market that all these wealthy people have figured out that we work with. They understand it. I was calling them in the middle of this, like thinking people, you know, you know, you think what you think. This is, are people going to be wanting to fire, you, you know, fire me? Are they going to be pissed? Are they, they're like, no, we're good. We know you guys got it. We know you, we prepared for it. And I was reminding them of the plans we put in place. And they're like, yeah. I remember, I remember you told us about these seven risks that you were watching and then COVID came in. Right. So it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, man. Like, but I think that would, that would be, I hope I answered your question. I know I kind of, no, I mean, no, you, I mean, no, and this, this is why I want to get you on, man, because like I said, a lot of the people I'm going to talk to is going to come from a basketball, basketball base, you know, because that's, you know, that's my network. That's what we did. Right. Yeah. That's my network. But, the same time, I think, especially like I said, people, our community of people, black people, we need to see other black people who, who have expertise and knowledge about finances, right? We need to see and hear from these type of people, especially in the period of time that we're in right now. Like I said, because there's already a money and money in, in black people is already a, a, a iffy, a iffy topic, right? So. Just to hear from a guy like yourself, like you said, who's one of the vice presidents at your company, uh, dealing with you know private wealth management, like your words. Hopefully, like I said, hopefully, man, people tune in and get to this part of the of our conversation because this this oh, yeah. this is what it was about for people to you know you know people who don't know people who maybe had questions didn't know who to ask or, or what questions to ask. Uh, I think you've helped some people, man, in, in this space that we're in to, you know, to kind of maintain, you know, maintain for the time being until, you know, until we can get back to the best possible way of normal life that, we, that, that we've known it to be. Uh, but. Yeah. Yep. Survive and thrive, right? I feel like right. that's what we're in right now. That's the phase we're in. And I think everybody needs to come to grips with, like, this is the new normal. Right. The stuff like I'm telling you, like with these experts talking on these calls, they're like, we need to get used to areas of the country just getting put on lockdown, like on shelter in place. Wow. That being a potential new normal because you see flare ups and you need to contain them. And so now we're building a new system where it's like, yeah, sections of the, you know, sections of the economy might not be able to, to be in function, but like we don't have to shut down everything ideally. Right. Or as we develop these therapies, maybe we get to a place where it's like, it's okay, but we're still, it's still going to be different. It's still going to be different. How people make money is going to be different. Where people make money is going to be different, right? And that's still forming. All that is really coming into focus right now. So from an investing standpoint, it's like there's so many different uh, potential areas that could be lucrative, right? And most people want to jump straight to that, like, tell me a hot stock, Coco, like, what do you guys think, you know, what's the area that you guys, 
are thinking about so I can go and invest in this. Like, do you even have, are you even in position to invest is the question that you need to ask yourself. Can you put money at risk? Because people are so ready to, to you know, to, to hit good, that home bro. run. That's good, man. Especially, like I said, especially for, now we're not talking about the wealthy people, but just for your ordinary people, man, who maybe, you know, want to think that they can invest now and really don't know how to invest. Like, are, like can, you, can you invest? Do you have money, uh, enough money in your bank account or saved somewhere to where you can take the risk to invest? Because that's what an investment is. It's a risk. It's not necessarily that you're going to make this money, but you could very well lose all of this money. Yep. Do you have a plan in place? Right. Do you know how much, you, you know, do you know what your spending plan looks like? Do you know how much money you're bringing in versus how much is going out every single month? Can it, can't like, can you track it to a T? You know what I'm saying? Like all these things matter because you start putting money into the market and then the first shock comes, you're like, Oh, I need that $500 back. That $500 might be worth 300 and you're sick. And you're sick right now, right? Because you didn't have, you didn't have, you didn't have the money to invest. You didn't have it at that time. And that's okay. That doesn't mean that you're going to, like, you've missed the whole thing. It's like this, this game, as long as I'm looking up right now, because as long as there's a blue sky and God lets us be on this earth right. doing what we do, we set up a system that is, it doesn't seem like it's going away anytime soon. So you're not missing out if you don't invest today, tomorrow, this year, while you're setting up. The main thing is, do you understand what you're trying to do and why? Do you have a plan in place? And then I'm like, yeah, I definitely encourage people to get started and, and like test the waters, right? Start with your retirement account. Start seeing how things work in a non kind of like pressurized way. Start with a little bit of money. Open a Robin Hood account. Go buy a couple of stocks, see what you can do. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, don't put... A, don't bet the house on anything. Right, right. Get a sense for how this thing is working and then like start educating yourself on everything, right? Because like we live in a time where it's all free. Look what we're doing. This is what we're doing. We're giving free game. Free this game. Is what I'm, this is it. This is what I'm trying to do. This is, I'm personally trying to do this as well in terms of just like using the platforms that are available to us to like try to give this and be a resource to as many people as possible because I just feel like it can't stay with me. It can't just stay with us. Right. It needs to find its way to more people that need it. And it can't be me waiting. They, you know, it can't be me waiting for them to be able to be my clients because they've made the hurdle so high, right? We're in a, I mean, I work in a place where to invest with us, you need to have $5 million of investable assets. That's not being worth $5 million, which is already an impressive thing, right? Your house, you know, all the stuff you own being worth it. No, no. You have five million extra, extra money to just be like, here, yeah. coke, make it do what it do. It's like what, right? So like this is what this is this is real life for some people. Just so like sometimes it's like I'm, it's like the Twilight Zone, bro. Like because you know, I take the train to work. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm still I'm a regular person. I'm still a regular person working in a world where nothing seems regular, right? right. In terms of the money part, but like it's but the tenants are all the same. The fundamentals are all the same. The game works the same way, whether you, you're working with $10 million or $10,000. The way, the way I would, the way I'm advising people to invest it, it's exactly the same. And, wow. and it requires the same type of discipline. It, you know, the pro, the difference, the real big difference is the person with 10 million has a way bigger cushion. They can take the falls much easier. So it actually makes more sense for the people with less, to do more due diligence and more homework, but but actually the way human psychology works, we're the most risky. So you're like, oh man, I need to make this ten thousand turn into thirty quick. Like, how do I do that? Like you said, because we're not thinking about the long. You know what I'm saying? We're not thinking about the long game. We're thinking about the quick lick, right? right. And we, right. And like you said, just I'm saying we, but just uh, the mindset of your, you know, your average, your typical person who's trying to invest. Like, okay, I need to turn this ten into twenty. How can I turn yeah. this 20? It's, you know, it don't work like that. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't work like that. No. So if you're going to put the 10 in, then you got to let the 10 sit, let it marinate, let it massage. It's going to go down some, but you got to trust that, you know, all right, I'm going to leave, you know, trust, trust the system, 
trust the market. Okay, eventually it's going to come back up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I had a conversation with a young fellow man the other day. He just finished his career. He's, he's uh, well, he's finishing his academic career. And then he's trying to get into, he's trying to figure out what he wants to do next. He wants to put some money to work. So he's like, oh, can you, you know, can we chat? I'm like, yep, of course. And in his mind, he was thinking long-term when he was telling me he wanted to do something for the next eight, nine months. I was like, let me just stop you right there, my guy. Like, I need you to start thinking in decade long chunks, right? When you're thinking about the, this investing, you need to think 10 years, at least 10 years plus for your money to actually have time to work in the market and grow in the way that it's supposed to. Anything that you're telling me you need in the next nine months, I would say don't even put it at risk, right? Don't even just get whatever little bit of interest they'll give you at the bank or in a savings account and let it be because it's too short of a time frame. And so much is happening right now that it's impossible for, and it's close to impossible for anybody to, you know, really do great things in that sort of a time frame. You can, it's possible, but you also, you have, you have, volatility going both ways you could hit it big or you could you could go to zero right and so like but it doesn't make sense to take that risk when you can basically cut most of that risk out by putting it spreading it out over a lot of different things mm -hmm. and letting it sit for a long enough time and so that's what I'm my thing is just make it simple man like it's always been my thing as a player too like I was always playing chess in my head in the game, right? Like I always knew where people yeah. were. I was, and that hurt you know, times. man, every time, every time, <laughs> let's keep it real. But like where I really figured it out later in my career was just make it simple, Coach. On the catch, check. I remember and I beat you. Tell you that, Coach. Like, Coach, just, just play, bro. Just, 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 just be instinctive. Like, because like you said, you would be – like, Coach, don't worry about what he's saying, bro. Like, like you said, just catch and go. They, they can't stop you, bro. Just catch and go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I just feel like, you know, now that, that, you know, plays into everything that I'm doing now where it's like I try to help people simplify because I think the investment game, they made it, they, they made it in such a way where, you, you know, not everybody can understand the vocabulary. Not everybody understands the pieces of the puzzles. That, that you need to build everything that you put together, you know, and they talk over people's head a lot of times and they don't really like, cause they don't want people, right? Because it keeps people in positions like mine in a job. Cause it's like, well, if you understand it, like I understand it, that's, that's the fear factor that I feel like a lot of, I see a lot in the industry is like, well, I can't let you as the client feel like you know as much as me or else you might not need me. And that's not, that's like completely opposite of how I approach it. I'm like, I want you to know what I know. I need you to know what I know. So you know why as your partner, I'm suggesting these different things. Right. And so like when I talk about simplifying things, I'm like you as the investor, you shouldn't be trying to game the system. You should be trying to ride the wave of the system. And the system has shown us that over the last hundred years, stock market just does this. It's going up. So all you really need to do is say, okay, do I have a good plan on what things I want to buy? Can I be consistent about and disciplined and sticking with that plan and letting time carry things through? Period. Period. I had literally just had the conversation with a friend today. And it's like she was getting so far in the weeds about like, which mutual fund, how much this one costs versus that one, how much diversification. I said, I love that you're going through this process because it's great learning but it's way more simple than you're making it right now. And I want you to understand how simple you can really make this because you, we, we have so much time on our side. Right. Any of those three funds that you picked would be great for you. I can break it down for you and tell you like, okay, of the three, I think this one's the best one. Sure. But at the end of the day, it's more about you having a plan and getting started on the plan because that means you have more time in the game you're putting more money to work, you're giving it more time to compound on itself and you're adding to it. So there's more of a mountain of money to grow on itself. Right. Cause, and that's it. And, and that's really it as like, you know, I mean, it's a whole industry built on like <laughs> making this feel, like feel as out of reach as possible, but 
to me, it really breaks down to that simple of an equation. Keep more of your money. Say, you know, of the savings that you have, pay yourself first, invest the difference, be disciplined about letting it grow over time. I think that's a bit, man, you, you dropped a lot of gems and jewels on us, man. I think that's what you just said is about like just understanding that when you're investing, that is, it's for a long period of time that you're, you know, that you saying, okay, I'm gonna put this money away and, and I want it to work for me over some years, right? Yeah. And having discipline to understand what you're investing in, right? And understanding the game of the market but also educating yourself or, or getting educated, asking questions. Because if you don't know, you can always ask questions, right? And that's yep. the biggest way to learn. Because if you don't ask, they're not it's like, like you've given out this free game and this is what you do for a living. Like this is, you get paid to do this. You have clients that pay you to do this, but you're on here talking for free about this. But a lot of people, if you don't ask the questions, then somebody just in general, not gonna just drop this information on you. Right. If you're curious about it, and you know somebody that you trust that you think knows about that issue, whatever it may be, that topic, ask the question. Yeah. Even if we're just talking about basketball, if you know a person who's made it to a certain level and you would like to, you know, for them to mentor you or whatever the case may be, ask questions, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's the it's it's one of the most powerful tools we have at our disposal. And I think, yeah, I don't know. Everybody's personality is different. But I think as basketball players, we take on, or as athletes in general, or people in any kind of position of, of being in the spotlight, I feel like you get very closed off to the outside world while you're in, while you're in the spotlight. And I think we do it as a defense mechanism because there are people that are not, that don't have your best interest in mind. There are fickle fans who love you today and then are talking trash about you and the team the next day. That's life. That's real, right? Yeah. That's, this is life. This is life. But what I feel like, what, one, of the main, one of the humongous things that I learned too late that I wish I would have understood earlier is the power of our platforms that we're on you know, while we're in those positions to be able to do exactly what you just said and reach out. And I mean, you could shoot moonshots. Oh, you know, you, depending on... I would say, depending on, you know, your status in the game or in whatever game you're in, you know, you could go as high as you, as you can imagine, right? But I feel like it doesn't even matter about your status. People, you can't underestimate how much people in this regular life want to be around celebrity, star power, athletes, entertainers, the whole thing. It's just like, it's a, it always was a strange thing to me. Like I never got it. Like I'm like, I'm a regular person. You can come up and talk to me, but the way yeah. people used to act, you know, like you're like, wow. But like, for me, I, I just remember being a ridiculous brat kid. Like it was annoying to me. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't go for that. I was, I, was, I just want to go home. Like I want to, is the press conference done? Okay, cool. I'm going home. Whereas now I would, if I could tell these, if I could tell my, 22 year old self i'm like interact interact right get to know like, people like i get told to you though it's like if you knew if you knew better you would do better man so we, like i said for us and I, I didn't have nobody teaching me how to network right yeah, didn't yeah. Have, so when i retired like i'm trying to get reacclimated to reintroduce myself to people i already knew but because I hadn't kept in contact with, you know what I'm saying, with my network, right? So now I'm re-reaching re out to people that I already know that I've had relationships with, but I haven't talked to in over, let's say a decade. Trying to, yep. you know what I'm saying, trying not to sound crazy, asking for advice and help, you know? But yep. we're not taught this coming up. We're not taught like, all right, man, this is what a network is. This is how you work it, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is how you, and it's not, it's not finessing, it's just a matter of, hey, man, just dropping a line every now and then. Hey, Coach, yep. how you doing, bro? Um, I was just checking yep. on the fam good. You know what I'm saying? Like, just something simple as that is keeping your network active. Yep. Yep. And it matters. And it's, it's incredibly simple. And you just don't know how far it goes. A simple word, a text, an email, a happy birthday. 
Right. To, you know, it's just, it, it shows that you care. And that's, that's all you're trying to do, right? To your point, it's not finessing. It's just showing that you care about people other than yourself. It's like most people don't know how the, the complexity that's behind most of the players that they love to watch do their thing or the singers that are out there doing their thing or the performers that are doing their thing. They don't know how much deeper it goes than maybe just the, the surface and what they're seeing and the exploits that they see on the court or whatever that your arena is, right? And I just feel like that's a huge missed opportunity. But, part, you know, it goes both ways. Like the fans and the people around you, they do want to know more, but they don't trust it if, you don't, if you're not open to, you know, that engagement in that way. And so, I mean, you make a powerful point. That's all that to say. I, I feel like it's one that I try to reiterate for, for, you know, for younger players when I get a chance to talk to them as well because I'm like, I, you know, I missed the boat on this. One. I missed the boat. And, like, I'll tell you, <laughs> that was one of the worst experiences for me when I was done was, was people that used to be on your bumper. Like, you can't get rid of them. No, you know what I'm saying? Let's like while you're playing. Nah, you and can then, catch up with them. Oh, I went to the final four because it's like, oh, I'm going to catch up with everybody, right? You know, it was the worst. The worst. Like, I was like, I never want to feel like this again. And that was part of my reason why, that was part of the reason why I was like real uh, shaky on going into basketball because I was like, oh, I see how this is going to be. I was like, I can't, I, I don't, I don't, you know, you know. It, it's like it feels like they're trying to they try to make you jump through the same hoops you had to as a player and I was like nah we got PhDs in this thing man you can't right. like what are you gonna tell me you can't tell me I don't know the game Young fella so you're gonna back. tell me your son in the back I don't know if he needs you come here son what's up what are you doing iPad battery probably ran out of it. <laughs> parenting. <laughs> parenting at its best right now. You're right, though, man. It's just, uh, like I said, man, I mean, it's, it's a lot of stuff that, that you're not taught in school that everyone needs to learn, and financial literacy is one of them. Uh, yeah. Just, I think, like you said, now with the platforms that you have with social media, right, Anybody can create and become just about anything they put, the, like literally, like you can, you can create and become whatever it is. Like you say, you can, you can shoot that moonshot and it's possible because of technology. All right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very possible, it's, man. It's all out there. I mean, honestly, I, I, I just, everybody's accessible, more accessible than they've ever been to your point. Right, that right. was my, that was, that was what I was driving to, but I didn't get there. It's right. just like, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you reach out if you see something? But like, ha put some thought into it, right? At least have have something to talk to them about, right? And I think that's where most of us get stopped up is like, well, you know, what do I have to talk to Mark Zuckerberg about? Well, what do you know about him? What do you guys have in common? What is it that you hope to actually learn from him? You know what I'm saying? Because those are the places that are easy for you to start. And then it's just a matter of like being a regular person and just having a conversation. And I think what most players don't really get or might be surprised by is how much Mark Zuckerberg might want to talk to them, you know, or hear about their stories. Cause you know, you never they're know. not in those locker rooms, right? Yeah, they're not in those environments. Know. Yeah. You never know. You but never Coke, know. man, bro, it was, it, it was good catching up with you, man. Like I said, we had a pretty good conversation off, off video so it was yeah. good catching up with you man i appreciate you i really do appreciate you man you shed some light on just your expertise of being doing what you do and talking about the economy and investments and how people can prepare themselves for that dropping those jewels man uh all the best to you and your family tell your wife i said hello if she, she remember of course of course tell her i say hello man and you know y'all be safe bro yeah, you guys too, man. All the best. All the best to you and the fam. I appreciate you. Appreciate all you're doing. Keep it up.